Welcome to another episode of the Family Gamers Podcast. This is episode 378. Hey, hey, hello, everybody. I am so excited to be doing this show. Do you know why I'm so excited to be doing this show, Nature? Because you're always excited to do this I show? I mean, that's true. I am always excited to do this show. But I'm excited <laughs> to do this show because this is the last show before things start to return to normal. Our kids go to school this coming week. And then I might have some free time. This is like the beginning of the thing. Also, I know that I'm going to be editing this show while watching football for the first time this year, which is exciting to me. (laughs) All right. So there's just, I'm just, I feel like life is returning to normal. You know what else the return of school means? Return of date breakfast. Yeah. And that is what we're going to be talking about this week. Hello, everybody. We are the Family Gamers. As always, I'm your host, Andrew, and I am joined by my lovely and wonderful wife, Anitra. That's me. Who I will be going on a a date breakfast with this week when our children are at school. (laughs) (laughs) But obviously, there's a bunch of stuff that we have to kind of get through before we get there. The first one of those things is a fact about our number 378. Okay, so what can you tell me about the number 378? Well... Anitra, everybody, I feel like, knows what the London Underground is. Do you know what the London Underground is? I rode on the London Underground a yeah. bunch. Yeah. yeah. So it's the subway system in London. And it's, yes. it's really nice. Like, it is nice. Like, there's a reason why it has kind of worldwide acclaim. Yeah, it's very nice. Unlike the New York subway, it does not run all night long. Mm-hmm. But overall, it is a nice system. And weird piece of trivia, they also have subways in London, but they are not underground trains. So did you know that there's also something called the London Overground? That I did not know. Yeah. So the London Overground is basically trains. What? It's called the London Overground. So in the London Overground network, there are a total of 507 cars or coaches. Okay. There are a total of 111 trains that pull those 507 cars. Okay. Of those 111 trains... Just over half of them, 57, are what are known as British Rail Class 378 Capital Stars. I was wondering where all this math was going, and yep. it was it was just a smokescreen. It was kind of, yeah. I mean, but but just over half of the trains in the London Overground Network are, in fact, Class 378 Capital Star trains. It is an electric okay. multiple unit passenger train specifically designed for the London Overground Network. It is part of Bombardier Transportation's Electrostar family. A total of 57 five-car trains have been built, most of which were originally built as three or four-car units. The Class 378s were ordered in August 2006, so relatively recently, and they are intended to stay in service until, I think I read somewhere, 2044. Okay. So if you go to London and you ride on the London Overground, there is a greater than 50% chance you will be riding on a train that is known as the 378 Capital Star. Okay. And that is my fact about 378. All right. What do you think? That was pretty cool. Mm, I thought so. I was doing a quick Wikipedia dive as you're saying that. And when I was riding around in London, the Overground system as it currently is in existence wasn't a thing yet. Oh, I see. Because it started in the early 2000s, and I was there in 2002. Does that mean I was also there in 2002? Yes. Okay. But I did ride some above-ground trains connected to the London Underground, but it is not the same as what is now called the London Overground. So There's no need to complicate everything. The more you know. (laughs) Do-do-do. All right. Speaking of not overcomplicating things, (laughs) let's talk about a message from our sponsor. Who does not overcomplicate things. Yeah. Yeah. As a reminder... First Move is letting us know how they would work with a young family earning a combined $100,000 with a net worth of about $25,000 and the goal of buying a home in the next few years. While it isn't the highest priority for this pretend client, looking at and adjusting the investment allocation for this client would still be important. We would go over their risk tolerance and their risk capacity. If you are invested in a way that won't let you sleep at night when the stock market is in free fall, then you're too aggressive. (laughs) We would also want to make sure that the investments don't have too high fees, which we may not have much influence over with most of the investments being in employer-sponsored plans. This could also lead to discussions about future savings and making sure we're saving in the right accounts to have some tax diversification and 
saving appropriately so that the money is available when it's needed without tax penalty. This can sound boring until you're in the middle of it. So if you've got questions about home ownership, investment, or any other financial question, go to firstmovefinancial.com slash familygamers. There you can set up a quick free phone call to see if First Move is a good fit for you. All right. Thanks so much to the team over at First Move Financial for sponsoring another episode of the Family Gamers Podcast. So, Anitra. Yes. It is um, getting close to the end of August, but um, we still haven't yet done our July monthly report. (laughs) So (laughs) we're going to talk about what we've been playing and we're going to cover our July monthly report. Then we're going to welcome our community members. What do you think of all that? That sounds good. This is actually going to be a really full show. Let's get to it. Yeah. All right, let's start off with what we've been playing. Top of the list is Hero Kids. Man, Hero Kids. This is something, I think it was like episode five. It was episode five. Yeah, that we had Justin Halliday on the show. He's the creator of Hero Kids. If you are listening to this and you have younger kids, I would say as young as four. Mm -hmm. That's what it says on the front of this thing. You should definitely think about listening all the way back to episode five which was admittedly like nine years ago, eight years ago, something like that. Nine years. Yeah. Hero Kids is an RPG that uses just D6s, and it is very simple, and it can be played by very young kids. You're still generally best off having a grown-up or older teenager or something be the DM. Oh, I agree with that entirely. But it's very simplified, and as proof, we played it last week. It is still fun for older folks, too. Yep. So there is a kind of a starter adventure that you can pick up called Basement O Rats. And we played through that starter adventure. We had um we had like laminated all the pages for it and stuff, so it's it's pretty durable. Mm-hmm. This is a print and play thing. You can get this on drive through RPG. Very easy. There's actually lots of adventures, so if you want to get into some more complicated stuff, you totally can do that. Uh, we had a good time and it took us all of like ten minutes to remember all the rules, which was basically me yeah. just kind of flipping through some stuff. The combat system is really, really easy. You basically have a number of dice that you can roll, and then you take the highest one, and that's the one that you get to use for the attack or the defense or whatever. It's a hit or it's a miss, and if it's a hit, it deals one point of damage, and if it's a miss, it does not. And it's it's really it. pretty straightforward. Yeah. There's a whole pre-built narrative. You could use the system to do whatever you want, but there's a whole pre-built narrative for Basement O Rats, which is kind of in that base set, and then there's lots and lots of other ones that you can kind of download and play. It's fantastic. It's really well put together for that target age range. I really recommend it. Yeah. I was actually recommending it to someone on X today. What? I know. I mean, it's also like because it's on DriveThruRPG, it's a print and play. It's super cheap. It's like 20 bucks or everything or something like that. Yeah. Well, and if you just want to get started, I mean, you're you're spending like five bucks or less. So yeah, it's fantastic. You you can get started really, really easily. Uh, Yeah. I was recommending it to someone who had already talked about how much they're small child is enjoying the quest kids but turning it into a much longer game than it needs to be because they're kind of pseudo dming it yeah then this is perfect so this yeah felt like the perfect choice for mm-hmm. them yep we also for the first time played nekojima so we got this in for review i had asked some friends who went to gen con like what did it look like what did you think and they couldn't tell me a whole lot they're like it looked cool but i don't really understand what's going on and then we got our copy This is a fun, very strategic dexterity game. A stacking dexterity game, I should say. You can play it cooperatively or competitively, but either way, you are rolling dice that tell you which quadrants of the city you need to place power poles in, and then you pull out a token that tells you what kind of power pole. There's three lengths of line. There's like a short, a medium, and a long. You need to put the power poles down. And then have the line so that the line is not touching anything else. Not touching any other pole, not touching any other line, not touching the ground. You know, it's a power line, right? So all that makes sense. You can stack the poles on top of existing poles. And here's the biggest twist. There are cats. So sometimes when you pull out a token from the bag, instead of being the colors of the short, medium, or long, instead it's black, which means that you set it aside, you pull another token... Once you finally pull one that's not black, you, you know, get your power lines, you put them down, and then you have to hang cats on the power lines. And, of course, with it still being power lines, the cat is only allowed to touch a single power line, and not a pole, and not another power line, and not the ground. 
So the rules in this end up being very easy to understand, very simple, and leave you a little bit of room for like, yeah, that's okay. No, that's not okay. And at the table, you can kind of decide. But it can get really challenging in your placement really quickly. Since we played cooperatively the first time, we were able to get really far. We played a lot of pieces before the whole thing fell over. But in a competitive game, I could see immediately trying to set this up to make it really hard for other people, and then that might bite you in the butt. But it's very cute. Mm. Yeah, I remember seeing this one at the Gamma Expo, and I was super excited for it, basically immediately. It yeah. just has a great table presence to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Just, oh, fantastic. I can't wait to play. Yeah. All right, next on the list is Dragon Keepers. This is a game from Cosmos. We've talked about this a couple of times. We are really getting ready for the review on this one. I don't know if it's going to be a snap review or a written review, but it's going to be really soon. So I think we'll just probably move on from this one. I guess the smallest thing I will say is our family's not super in love with this one, which is a little bit of a disappointment. The theme is totally pasted on. And frankly, the theme was a big reason why we picked this one up. Yep. That's, and the art is great. Yeah, it looks great. It just... And the game is fine. It just fell flat. It just fell flat. It's not bad. It's mm -hmm. just fine. Yeah. Uh, we've been playing some more Unmatched. Since we don't currently have an Unmatched set that we need to work on reviewing, we felt more able to branch out to other things. So we, Hooray! <laughs> yay! Uh, so we played some Cobble and Fog, and I was reminded why I love playing Sherlock against my children. <laughs> In all seriousness, though, I had forgotten that Sherlock Holmes has way more scheme cards than any other character I've ever played, because his whole thing is about looking at the other player's hand or guessing what's in their hand and kind of maneuvering everybody else where you want them to be rather than doing a lot of direct attacking. So that was fun. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's been a long time since I've played a character out of the Cobble and Fox set and we love it. We love, love it. it. So I really should be doing some more of that. Mm -hmm. Maybe on a date night. Maybe. All right. Uh, next on the list, we're going to talk about Tirna Nog. So this is a game that's been getting lots and lots of buzz, I guess. Yeah. Totally sold out at Gen Con, ran a, a new Kickstarter. It's actually still going. So if Tuna Nog was something that was on your list, if you are not aware, head over to that crowdfunding platform that we all know and may or may not love, Kickstarter, and you can actually kickstart it for the next printing. There's also an expansion. We actually kickstarted for the expansion and the... I don't know what escape they call room them. Game. It, the escape room game. It's an 18 card thing in the same you know universe. So with a copy of Tuna and Oak already, it was $19 for us to get the expansion and this little kind of yeah. um, escape room 18 card situation. So go get your copy of Tuna and Oak. Go do it. Yeah. Uh, like yesterday. So you had played this a few times before and I was like, hey. I had played it one time before as a prototype on the other side of the world. Yeah. In my defense. And like, especially with all the hype around the Kickstarter to reprint it, I'm like, hey, can we actually play this game <laughs> so I can recommend it to other people? Because I don't feel good about that if I have no idea how to play the game. Sure. It's been a busy month. Anyway, Tune and Oak, great game, split draft, which means that you are putting your workers in between two cards in the tableau. So everybody takes turns putting their workers out, and then everybody takes turns picking their workers up and taking one of the two cards that they put their worker in between. I guess technically you don't have to put your worker in between two cards, but like, why wouldn't you? I think you do actually have to put them between two cards unless you've got some special power thing. I um, thought you could put it on a side that didn't have a, another card next to it. Uh, I, I, don't I don't know. Do anyway, I didn't really check matter. the rules on it that. Doesn't, we're, we're not doing a full review right now or anything. Yeah. So the purpose of drafting these cards is over the course of a bunch of rounds, the exact numbers are not relevant, you are drafting these stories. Are they storied legends? I don't even remember. Places, um, cause characters. Because you're, you're a storyteller, yeah. basically. And you're drafting these so that you can then put them into these three rows that you have in front of you. So these three rows are different kinds of scoring mechanics that are selected or whatever at the beginning of the game. Everybody has the same set of three, mm -hmm. but they're different things like you're going to score points for every card that you put here that has a different number than any other card in the same row or column, right? So if you can put a card that has an eight in the upper left-hand corner, you know, in the first spot, and you never put another eight on that row, and the first spot on the second and third columns is not an eight, you're going to get eight points for that card, yeah. for example. Then there's like set collection, and then there's, you know, you'll score points for this card if the card next to it is lower than it or something like that. Yeah. Or like there's all sorts of, okay, all sorts of like different that. ones. And basically you kind of do this. There's also... Uh, scoring for regions, so all the cards have a different color. So if you have the largest connected section of, you of know, each color. of the four yeah. colors, you're going to get points for that and, you know, stuff like that. So it's a really 
interesting, I'm going to call it set collection. The sets sort are of, all yeah. different, right? Set collection slash... I mean, it's a tableau building Tableau kind of thing. building, yeah. geometric puzzle kind of a game. Yeah. And much like what you love about role player, a lot of these cards also have special powers that will allow you to, you know, maybe place your pawn for drafting differently or... Maybe let you move cards around that you've already put down in your tableau. So you're not locked in as quickly as you might think. Yep. So that's Tiernan Oak. It's beautiful. I mean, it, it's a really pretty mm-hmm. game. I, the art is like kind of watercolory. I don't really know how to describe it, but it's really nice. I like it a lot. It's nice, and it was much easier to play this game than I thought it was going to be from my first glimpses of it. There's one of those... High strategy, low rules, I think. Uh, okay. Well, sure. not really low rules, but like <laughs> It's low simpler rules than overhead. it initially looks. Yeah, low overhead. Yeah. Low overhead is fair. Yeah. Cool. All right. What else you got? Another thing we're working on reviewing, we have the archipelago boards for Railroad Inc. I say it archipelago. It's islands. You have a, a board with a bunch of islands. <laughs> this is the first Railroad Inc. expansion I've seen that is not about dice. And instead is, you can use this with any Railroad Inc. set you already have. It's just replacing the board section. So we played this with our copy of Railroad Inc. Challenge, and we did still use challenge cards. The thing about the Archipelago is that you get more rounds to play. A normal game of Railroad Inc. is seven rounds. Archipelago expands it to ten rounds. Instead of being on a seven-by-seven board, you're now actually on an eight-by-eight board but each island is its own little 4 by 4 And then the islands have ways to connect between them. So you have four 4 by 4 islands with connections. It was interesting, the mechanical things that were just slightly different. If you've done Railroad Inc. Challenge before, this is not a big leap in terms of lots of new things. It's like one or two tiny little new things. If you've only done regular Railroad Inc., there's a few other things you're going to have to learn. but The biggest thing for me was that I have felt as I really got good at playing Railroad Inc. or Railroad Inc. Challenge that the games just feel just a little bit too short. Like I really want it to be an extra round or two than what it is. And since this one is 10 rounds, even with more spaces to fill in, it felt like it was a better length, a more satisfying length of game without being too long, without overstaying its welcome still. Yeah, you play a lot more of this game than I do in general, so I just don't <laughs> yeah. really have an opinion on this one, but I'm glad you like it. That's fine. Uh, and I haven't played it with you yet, so I'll, I'll pull this out and, sure, and show absolutely. you sometime. Yeah. All right, the next game on the list, this is a game that I have actually really wanted to play for a long time and unexpectedly got the opportunity to, and this is the game Project L. This was on crowdfunding last year, I think. I don't even know. Or something. I, I remember it, seeing whatever. a black it box, yeah, exactly. really attractive polyominoes, mm-hmm. yep. bright colors. The, I mean, the okay, the polyominoes in this game basically look like chiclets. Like, they look like polyomino shapes, but they have the same finish as, like, chiclets. That, like, shine and yep. slight, like, yep. beveling. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So this is a really interesting game. So Project L is a game where you are trying to complete what are those things where you have to put the shapes in to make a larger shape? Something a grams. Tangram? Tangrams, sure. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like that, but with polyominoes. So you have three actions on your turn, and you can take from these two rows of face up cards in the middle of the table. There's black cards and white cards. White cards are easier, black cards are harder. The game ends when the stack of black cards is depleted. Each one of these cards has an inset, basically, tangram that you fill with polyominoes. Mm. Some of them have a point value on them. All of them have a picture of a of one of the polyomino pieces on them. Okay. So in your three actions, uh, you can take whatever action, however many times you want to. You can take one of these cards and put it into your one of your four reserve spots. You can put one of your little chiclet pieces onto one of your cards. You can swap a chiclet piece for another one of the same air quote size, which is basically if you reduce everything to the one by one squares, right? So like an L, Mm. which is three, and then a one nub is the same as like a T, which is three and a one nub in the middle. So you can swap. You can do a, a one level upgrade. You can do a downgrade. Okay. But you couldn't go from like a, a rectangle of two to like a rectangle of four. That would be, you would take two sure. steps to do that, right? Sure. You follow me? Okay. 
the one special action, which is the only thing you can only do once, is it's called like the master builder action. And the master builder action allows you to put one of your polyomino pieces in each of your tiles that has these kind of slots in it. Okay. So you can, you know, if you have three of these cards in front of you, these tiles in front of you, you can basically put three things down for one action. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay. So when you complete a shape, you dump out those little chiclet pieces back into your supply. You keep them and you score that shape, which means at the end of the game, you're going to sum its value with the rest of your tiles. Okay. And you get whatever that shape is that was pictured on it. Not the one you filled in, but like the uh, picture of okay. the... Oh, so, okay. So in filling in these cards, you're also gaining more shapes to add so Correct. you can fill in more cards. Correct. So it becomes this kind of 2D spatial, almost engine builder kind of a game, mm. right? And that's essentially the game. So you're kind of trying to set things up so that your master builder action is maximally effective. And eventually... Basically, everybody hits kind of a breaking point where all of a sudden people are starting to take these black one, the black tiles, to fill those guys in. Mm. And that's essentially it. Like, there's really not a lot of other stuff going on in this game. But it's just like, it's really nice and fulfilling. And it does a really good job because it's not trying to do too many things. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's Project L. It's nice and it's really a clean game. It, you know what I mean? There's not a lot of like junk going on kind of thing. So I really enjoyed that one. I think I said while we were playing that it's probably not a game that I would ever bother getting because, you know, I feel like games like Baron Park, we go into it generally expecting me to win, but there's enough other stuff in it that you enjoy playing it anyway. This is so like purely abstractly. This, this would be the Andrew Wins game. <sighs> I mean, I don't like saying it like that, but I just feel like there's not enough other stuff in this to bring your interest level to a point where you would want to keep playing it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Unfortunately, I feel like this is a game I would be interested in playing, but probably not with you. Not because you're not a good sport about it, but just because there's something about like, okay, this game looks interesting and I want to play around with it. Oh, never mind. I've just been destroyed. Like, I'm not sure there would be enough to keep my interest knowing that I'm going in and it's just like, there's no way I'm going to do as well as you. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I do think that it is important to point out that when we played this game this past week, I did not win. Did our friend who owned the game win? No. No? Asher won. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Well, that means I need to tell you about the game that I played with Asher today. Okay. I played Streamer Standoff. Okay. And Asher won because... Even though you and I have been content creators for nine plus years, this game hit a little bit too close to home. I appreciated what this game is doing, but I was like, oh man, it's just like real life. I'm always behind the trends. I, When I have a hit, it means I end up being known for something that isn't what we usually do. And I'm just struggling to keep viewership up. <laughs> so, hold on. Is this a situation where art imitates life, or are you just saying, like, it felt like that as you played this game? This feels like art imitates life. Like, I was not doing particularly well at the game, and within the game mechanics, like, that's what it would be called. Like, I am behind the trend, so instead of hitting the trend at just the right part to get huge amounts of viewers, I'm hitting it too early or too late and mm -hmm. getting small amounts of viewers. Because I usually hit things too early. That's my issue. Right. Yeah. I usually hit them too late, but and yet somehow between the two of us, we still can't manage to meet in the middle. Yeah, Streamer Standoff is a neat, fairly light kind of game designed to mimic the idea like you are a streamer trying to build your audience. And it's the first person to get to 20 million audience is basically the winner. And like there's a final turn sort of deal. But mm -hmm. you have a small hand of cards that are elements you can put in your videos. And every turn, you're just playing a single card out to either add to a video you're already working on or start a new video. And then at the end of your turn, you can either do some stuff with tokens to sort of massage what's happening in the whole game, or you can claim a trend. Like, I have a video that now meets all of the requirements for this trend. I'm going to claim this trend card. It's going to get me a certain number of viewers and some other bonus. Sure. Which could be anything from even more viewers to like, now you have this little like, this thing that your channel is known for and you have this symbol all the time. Okay. It's really like a set making pattern matching game. Mm -hmm. But 
the theming worked really well because like I said, like I came out of feeling I'm like, yeah, I kind of fail at this game just like I fail at, <laughs> at being a super popular content creator in real life. <laughs> Aww. Hey, everybody out there. Can you send messages to Anitra and tell her that you love her as a content creator? Oh, yeah, that would be really nice. But it was an interesting game, and I think it would be a good fit for teens and adults who are more plugged into that kind of world than I am. Okay. So, I mean, just kind of exploring a little bit, like, do you feel like the game suffers because you're not plugged into that world, or it just the theme just doesn't hit for you because the, you're not plugged into that? Like, like, is it a mechanical problem or is it yeah, just no, the theme it, doesn't work for you? Like, it's, what's the it's deal? More, it's more that the theme makes me feel like an old fuddy-duddy, which I kind of <laughs> am. Like, I'm I'm okay with that. I'm at peace okay, with that. Sure. Um, but I could recognize a couple of the things that were coming up because of the videos that our kids watch oh, and, okay. will, and will show me. Sure. So, yeah, and that's why I say, like, I think this is geared towards a younger and more in tune audience than okay. me. <laughs> okay. okay. Is this a game that you, you feel like after the review process, you're like, it's just not going to appeal to you because yeah, of it, the, the... I don't find it super appealing. Um, okay. But, but but that's purely a function of our interests. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm so interested, like, intrigued just based on what you've just said, like, of, of what this is going to look like. Yeah. Like, for me, I'm really interested to play this. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let's talk about the last game on the list. I was going to say, should we? I think we should. We played it three times in a row. We did. We did. And this is a game, Chrono Trek. So this is another game that I saw at the Gamma Expo. This is a game from Looney Labs. I actually saw the game Chrono Knots at Gamma Expo, but then I saw that they had a Star Trek themed version. I was like, can I, can I take that one, please? And, and I kind of got the, yes. fine. So Chrono Knots and also Chrono Trek is this really interesting game. It definitely has some you play it and you're like i can feel the flux in this right i guess that's the easiest way for me to say i mean it's looney labs and it's a card game like there was going to be some of that we're gonna randomly change up the rules on you yeah but i mean but i mean it's a very definitively different it's a very different thing. game okay yes. so in this game uh, everybody has an identity so i'm just going to describe it from the star trek side of things the chrono knots game is generic like world history the identities are like presidents and stuff like that but in the star trek version everybody has an identity who were you i don't even remember you were old janeway at one point like when i was young janeway which was weird yeah i was spock in one of the games we played you were spock i thought i was spock i don't remember it doesn't matter the uh, kirk pike like every, all the you know yeah. major star trek characters are in there your identity is secret and your identity has three requirements on it usually it's an item and two events and there's this grid of events that all start on the this is the way it actually happened in the star trek universe Yes. side right they're all cards and what happens over the course of this game is you are drawing cards and you are playing certain cards to maybe flip some of these things over to like trigger these events so that different things happen and when you flip something over there might be some coordinating events that also get flipped over and it's all denoted on the cards and basically pretty much like that's the game and the whole goal is you're trying to maybe pick up a certain item that your character needs and certain events have to have taken place in a, on this board, right? So you might have had to have flipped something to the side that it didn't start as, but that has some other effects and it flips other things over and maybe one of those you need to figure out how to flip back without flipping the first thing over, like something like that, right? In order to get the three requirements that you have on your card so that you can say, oh, I have my requirements, I win the game. The identities are ranked in difficulty, so yeah. some of them, like Q, is I guess the hardest one. To Q play is as. is one of is one of the hard ones, yeah. Yeah, and so there's a couple different things, and I'm not going to get into all of it, but there's a couple different things that make it harder to do certain things. Yeah, uh, there's this whole like temporal anomaly situation, which is kind of this specter like this damocles sword that hangs over the whole game so there's a lot of really interesting things like that the reason why we played it three times in a row is because there's kind of a little bit of setup involved in laying out the chronology of all of the events yeah well it's four rows with like nine cards in each row yeah, and they're like in that. a very specific order right right and so like once you get all that set up like it's really not that hard to reset to play yeah. another game until we're like, ah, let's just do it again. Ah, game, let's just do it and again. And the games don't take that long. Right. So I'm really interested. So we just played this two player, but I'm really interested to see how this feels at a higher player count. You know, like Flux at a high player count, if the player right after you does something and you're like, oh, that's the thing I need, then you have to wait for everybody else to go. And basically something's going to go south 
right before yeah. it gets back to you and so there's definitely a level of frustration when you play a high play account game of flux and i'm really curious to see how bad that is with this game because i think that's like that's the big issue with flux is like it's almost like phase 10 right like it just gets so messed up in the middle and, yeah. and messed up is relative yeah so yeah i think this is probably not going to have the problem that flux has of just feeling endless it could if it went the wrong way, but I just I don't think it's going to be that much of a problem. There were a lot more cards we pulled that were obviously helpful to you rather than being like, well, I got to play something. So I guess I'll just play this thing and see what happens. Well, in my defense, I also threw out a lot of cards and cycled through cards a lot more. Right. Well, and yeah. that's it. Like yeah. there are cards that say, hey, basically dump as much as you want from your hand and draw a new hand of cards or name a artifact and look through the deck and find the artifact you want. So even in a two player game, you're not just trying to cycle through huge amounts of cards to find that one item you need to win. Right. Right. Hugely. Mm hmm. All right. So anyway, so that was Chrono Trek. That was the game that we played last night, and we played it a bunch of times. And then I watched Star Trek with the boys tonight. It's been oh, good. fun. Which Star Trek did you watch? Watch some Voyager. Okay. All right. Cool, cool. We agreed after seeing some of the cards that we really need to... Uh, I need to watch more Voyager. Rewatch Voyager. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess it's monthly report time. Anitra, do you want to go first? Sure. Okay. Okay. So this is the July monthly report. I had 37 plays of 18 games, which is... Really good considering I had a 10 day gap where I didn't play any games at all on my trip. How did it, it because of the trip? Is, that, is yeah. that how it happened? Okay. Yeah. I was about to ask you, you know, how it possibly happened, but okay, that, I guess that, makes sense. I did not play any games at all during my trip. We talked about this. So when I looked at my stats, I was like, oh, I, but I had pretty big game days like right around July 4th and then not too long after everybody got back from our July trips. So. Yeah, that got me back up to 37 plays, so more than one play per day. Well, you still beat me, if that makes you feel any better. I had 29 plays of 15 unique games. Okay. 63% of my games were at home, which goes to show you how much I played when you were in yeah. Spain and I was in Detroit. The vast majority of my games were played at two players, 55% of my games. Sure. Were play I guess it's not a vast majority. No. H index of majority. three. Okay. Merchants of Magic at four plays. Clash of Magic Schools Unboxed, Tether, and Charcuterie at three. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So my age index was also three, but my most played game was Tether, followed by Autumn, which I bought in Barcelona, as we mentioned. Uh, Merchants of Magic, Unboxed, and Unmatched. All right. I have Autumn and Unmatched at two plays apiece. So yeah. there you go. All right. That's a quick look at our monthly report. And guess what? Next show we'll do a monthly report again so yes, there we you will. Go. i mean i guess the way it's supposed to work is every other show we're doing our monthly report more or less so uh, yeah. it's not really all that shocking it happens sometimes. there you go mm -hmm. yeah. all right let's also welcome the newest members of the family gamers community on facebook all right let's do it welcome to anderson welcome to rosario welcome to craig welcome to robert welcome to dinara welcome to chuck Wabuka. if i pronounce that wrong i apologize welcome to lena welcome to jason and welcome to the Maximus family. Yes, that that's like such an epic name. We are the Maximus family. I love that so much. Anyway, this penguin is down for business. Yes. Is that a penguin? Yes. Okay. Serious yeah. game time penguin. It is time for games. Spikes and goggles and all. Spikes and goggles and aviators <laughs> and a puffy jacket. And a pocket. Do not and mess. Do yeah. not mess with this penguin. He will mess you up. He's like, we play games or we go out back. Yeah, right, right, right. Anyway, welcome to the community. Don't feel threatened by the penguin, please. Come on in, talk about uh, some of the games that you are playing with your family, or if you are not one of the people that we named, then go welcome the people that we named. Yes, please do. Seems pretty simple to me. All right. Uh, you want to keep going with some community stuff? You want to take a break? Let's keep going with the community stuff. All right, let's do some more community stuff. So it is back talk time. We, uh, of course, just referenced some trips that we uh, just took. On the last show, we talked about playing Sagrada because Anitra went to the Sagrada Familia. And our backtalk question this week is, have you ever played a game at a location it's based on? Anitra did not actually play Sagrada at the Sagrada Familia. I did not. She just played it after the fact. Or has a trip ever motivated you to play a certain game? Answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we got uh, some really nice responses to this one. I will look over at the Facebook community where Joseph Reininger says, We had a vacation on the Normandy coast of France. You guys are going to cool places. I'm going to Detroit. <laughs> anyway. You should have played Motor City. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't think we have it anymore. Anyway, one of the towns we stayed in was St. Malo. The town square has a game store, so naturally we had to check it out. In the game store, we saw a game called St. Malo. We decided to buy game. it just for the cool factor. It turned out to be a great game, a roll and write designed by Inca and Marcus Brand, who are awesome but apparently they didn't know who they were back then. It's been a hit in our family since the purchase. Thanks for the awesome pod. Oh, thanks for the awesome. You're welcome. Thank you. P.S. We also tried to buy Bruges in Bruges, but the game store was sold out. That seems like a, an epic fail on selling out of the game that's based on the place. I mean, remember, I told you the game store I went to in Barcelona, they had Sagrada Artisans, but they did not have the base game Sagrada. That felt strange to me. And what's the Barcelona one? Walk in Barcelona? There, zoom, the, zoom in Barcelona? Zoom, zoom in they Barcelona. They didn't have that one. There's another Barcelona game. I don't know if they had that mm. one. We got quite a few responses in our Discord conversation. Starting with Peter, who said, well, there was this one time in Arnak. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. But in all seriousness, he was like, I don't know. I'd love to personally go trekking the national parks, but we don't live close enough to them. Yeah, right? Like, what the heck? I don't know where Peter, I don't know where you live, but we live in New England and there is exactly one. Yeah. And he recommends to us a fun book series, The National Park Mysteries, which in addition to being middle grade mysteries have a section in the back of each book of like what to do if you go visit this park so that's cool i like that but Kristen said the closest we've come is meeting the theme not the place so we play camping spot it and tinder blocks every time we go camping so i have you played tinder blocks i've seen it i really like that game it's a really good game so i'm kind of jealous that you got to play tinder blocks but anyway i digress Uh, Adrian says, since I have family from New York City, I'm attracted to New York City games. Reasonable. Sure. So we've played New York 1901. Great game. Awesome. And Santorini, New York. Haven't played it, actually. But I've not played it there. Likewise, since I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, I had to get tickets to ride San Francisco. Sure. That tracks. Sure. No pun intended. (laughs) I played trekking through the national parks since we used to go to them as a family back when I was a kid. Same with parks and trails. I'm assuming that's trails, not trials. Yeah, probably a misspelling. Yeah. All right. JP chimed in with, I've certainly played some Ticket to Ride on a train. (laughs) Love it. (laughs) And Derek Bruff one-upped that with, I definitely brought a print-and-play copy of Penny Rails on a day-long train ride. I love Penny Rails, and I can definitely see playing that on a train. Yeah, it'd be fun. Well, the other thing that Derek says is, one time while playing parks, Emily and I discovered that there was a nearby national park we hadn't visited yet. Cuyahoga Valley National Park. It was, in fact, the closest national park we hadn't visited, so we booked an Airbnb for a visit there before we finished playing the game. I love that. And they even included a picture of the place on the card with them standing there holding the card. That's pretty great. Which is fantastic. That's pretty great. It's right up there with, I am Facebook friends with one of the senior designers of Lorcana, and Mm -hmm. like he is going all over and posing with the Lorcana card for the Disney characters at Disney, which is kind of cool. Like That's a cool thing. Is he like having them sign them? Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. He's not playing Lorcana though, so it doesn't fit. So Fletch, you don't win. But but, um, no, thank you. I mean, this has been a great one. This has been a really kind of fun process of just reading everybody's contributions to yeah. the backtalk question. We will have another backtalk question later on in the show. But right now we're going to take a quick break and play for you our snap review of Flip Circus. Mm, fun game. Pretty fun. We'll be right back. When's the last time you went to the circus? I went to a carnival a couple of weeks ago with the kids. Does that count? No. Well, we don't have to leave the comfort of our house because now we're going to the Flip Circus. This is a snap review for Flip Circus. Flip Circus is a game for two players by Julian Gerard and published by Yellow. Using both memory and deduction skills, it's best for ages 10 and up, and it takes about 15 minutes to play. Even though the game packs into this small pouch, the art in Flip Circus has lots of detail. There are five kinds of performers on these cardboard poster tiles. They feel like vintage circus posters to me, except for the fact that they're a little bit smaller. The performer portraits are also on these tokens, along with a sixth performer, the clown. There's some helpful graphic design here to remind us of what each performer's special power is, and what performer could possibly be on the other side of the token. There are also two small player aids and these cute little wooden applause tokens. 
So now that we talked about the tokens and the graphic design, let's explain the mechanics of Flip Circus. Every game starts by building the poster with the five poster tiles, then laying out the performer tokens. Place the five clowns face up in a loose ring. Then shuffle the remaining five tokens and put one between each pair of clowns. The second player gets an applause token, then the first player starts. Your goal in Flip Circus is to collect three performers' posters. If both players have two posters, you can also win the game by getting all of the clowns face up. On your turn, you must take two actions, but you can take the same action twice. You can swap two adjacent performer tokens, flip a single performer token over, or use a performer's ability. You can also spend an applause token to take an additional action or to secretly peek at the back of a token. Your goal is to line up a set of three matching performer tokens. If all three tokens for a performer are face up and adjacent to each other, you have gotten that performer's autograph. Flip over the middle token of the three after taking the performer's poster tile. You keep the poster until the end of the game. The other player cannot take it away from you. If you create, or add to, a group of clowns, you won't get a poster. But you do get an applause token. Remember, you can use that for an extra action. So, let's talk about those performer abilities. Anitra, you already talked a little bit about the clown. The strongman and the animal tamer have abilities that affect how and when they can be moved. But the other three performers have abilities that you can use instead of a normal action. The acrobat can swap places with the performer directly across the ring. The magician can swap the two tokens that are adjacent to himself. And the fortune teller allows the player to secretly peek at the back of both tokens adjacent to herself. Don't forget, there are two ways to win this game. Collect three posters or get all five clowns face up when there's only one poster left unclaimed. So that's how to play. What did we expect from Flip Circus? Well, with a game like this, I always feel like I'm either going to really like it or really not like it. So I expected to have some stronger opinions about this one, which I do. Talk about those in a minute. I also like the art style, and generally I like the graphic design a fair bit as well. But as far as gameplay is concerned, I had no idea. Obviously, we'd be flipping the poker chips. I mean, that seems kind of obvious with a name like Flip Circus, but that's really all I kind of had. I liked that this was in such a small pouch. And when I first picked up the tokens, I really liked the feel of them. From the name, I also thought we'd be flipping the tokens for random rewards or like trying to hit things with them like a dexterity game or something. Mm. But that is not at all what this game is about, as you know. So let's talk about what surprised us. Me, personally, I expected this to be a way more casual game than it is. It's not to say that it's not a short game or an easy game to understand or yes, something like that, but there's a ton of strategy in the different performers and how they all move. Even once I found out this was a memory game, I was surprised at just how much I needed to constantly pay attention. <laughs> I can use deduction to figure out some information, but I need to keep track of the tokens that I know. And I can't do that if I look away from the table because tokens are moving or flipping on pretty much every turn. This is a game that is pretty simple in concept, but I feel like I'm really exercising mental muscles, especially if I want to be competitive against you. Okay, well then, Anitra, do you recommend this game? Well, Flip Circus is a sort of memory duel against another player. If you like memory and deduction, this is going to be a great fit for you. It's really portable, but it's not the kind of game that I would normally bring a lot of places because this is not the kind of game I can play with distractions around. I loved this game and the mental puzzle of trying to remember more or less the status of all 10 tokens. I will say that sometimes, especially because we have our dates during breakfast, I could tell my head was just not, like, this is not the game for this morning. So I definitely know when I'm ready to play a game like this because I feel like I have to be all in for it, right? Of course, that means that maybe it's not a good date game, even though it's a two-player game, if you really want to focus because that means less brain space for, you know, small talk. Or not. Is, is distracting your opponent by flirting like a next-level strategy? Anyway, we give Flip Circus... Four performers out of five. 
And that's Flip Circus. In a snap. All right, so we mentioned that Flip Circus is not a great date game. I mean, it's a great date game if you don't want to talk to your date because you're focusing. But yeah, I don't that think that doesn't that's make a good date no, game. It doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> All right. So this is episode 378. Almost 200 episodes ago, we talked about <laughs> date night games. On episode 180, we talked about date night games. It was forever ago. Yeah. So what about this? I am going to look through the list that I made in episode 180 okay. and talk about our top games for date night four and a half years ago. And you can give me a yes, no, or maybe for each of these games. Uh, okay. Onitama. Ooh. Um, hmm. I really want to say maybe for Onitama. I, I think that's a maybe for me yeah. as well. Yeah. How about Tussie Mussy? I'm going to say yes on Tussie Mussy. I, I think the theme, the yeah, theme really it, it seals just, it, it just, as a date game. It just game. brings it over the, over the edge, yeah. Absolutely. Especially if you read out the little secret messages with the flowers when you Love hand it. them over. Love it. Shobu. Um, I am going to say maybe so as to not reveal anything. Okay. All right. Fair. Trip lock. I... <clears throat> I'm going to have to say no on this one. I love yep. this game, but you don't love this game. I don't for exactly the same reason that I had trouble with Flip Circus, which is just there's a ton of hidden information. You have to super focus on the game to have any chance of remembering what's going on. And the graphic design is just barely not good enough. Yeah. Okay, so no on Trip Lock. Saikatsu. Uh, this is maybe leaning towards no. I agree. Okay, so we're going to say no. I'm going to say no. Senshi. Mm. I, I really barely like this remember game. this game. I really game. like this game. I'm going to say no on this one, not because it's bad, but because I just think there's better games. The fact that I barely remember it is, yeah. is does not bode well. Not, not a good thing. Yeah. Um, cartographers. I'm going to say no on this one because mm. I think Cartographers as a roll and write is better with more people, especially okay. because of the monsters. Okay. I, look, if I'm on a date with you, I don't want to do mean stuff to you. I mean, sometimes we, we play some games to get me. Yeah, yeah. But okay, I think it's different if you're playing like a dueling style game versus I'm going to mess up this right, thing you right. created. I'm going to mess up your sense? plans. Yeah, does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's fair. Yeah. Jaipur. This used to be one of our favorite two player games. I don't think we've played it in years. We haven't played it in a long time. I'm going to say maybe leaning to yes on this one. I really like it. It's just really good. It's a great game. We just, we haven't been playing it. So, yeah. well, it's because we've been playing review games. <laughs> well, and there's a couple of games I think that we're more likely to reach for. Maybe. maybe. I think we're going to get into those in a minute. Maybe. So, back on this list from four and a half years ago, I have Not Dice. I'm going to say no. I didn't I, even want it to be on the list to begin with, to be honest <laughs> with you, but you like it so much and I want you to be happy that I was like, okay. Okay. Fair. So um, this is my opportunity to say no. That's fine. No. I would also say no these days. I love the idea of it, but yeah. Okay. The Grizzled. I got to say no. It's too depressing. I, I love this game. It's a great game. It's a great game to play. It's a great game to play as a couple, but I don't want to play it on a date. It's too sad. Right in our list, I was like, this breaks our rule for themes that are not too heavy. <laughs> I would probably still say yes on The Grizzled. Okay. There's something about the way the cooperation works that just makes me feel closer to the person I'm playing it with. Okay. I um, mean, in the sense that, like, watching a movie that's sad, you know, makes my partner, like, cry on my shoulder, and that's kind of sweet. Yeah, kind of like, like that. I like that part, I guess. Yeah, kind of like right. that. And then the last one on the old list was Brave Rats. All right, let's talk about a game that's about war that is completely different from Grizzled. How's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say no on this one. I just... There's just too many other games that are better. Yeah. Honestly, at this point, I would probably rather go to Love Letter than Brave Rats. I just... Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You were not a Love Letter fan back in the day. I'm still not a huge Love Letter fan, but it's just... It's less complicated feeling than Brave Rats. Brave Rats is more complicated than it needs to be. Okay. Now I kind of feel bad that I gave away our copy of Batman Love Letter, the hotly sought after Batman Love Letter. It's okay. Like, Love Letter is still not in, like, my top 10. I okay. just, I would pick it over this. All right. All right. Okay. Well, that's 200 episodes to go list of <laughs> date night games. I built a completely new list. Okay. Which does have a very small amount of overlap. And the ones that it felt like might be on this list, I also just added to the bottom of this list. So this is like... Okay. A baker's dozen or so. Sorry, it um, just is. I also built a brand new list of four. Oh, this this games. is more than four. Yeah, this, this is a lot more than four. Okay, yeah. why don't we do it like this? We're gonna do it like a just quick, like snap judgment, yes or no. Okay. 
And then I'm going to go back through the yeses and we'll talk about the yeses. That's And we'll attempt to whittle this list down to a manageable number. How's that? All right. All right. Okay. Number one, Jekyll versus Hyde. Yes. A hundred percent. Yes. That was number one on my list as well. Okay. Number two, Compile. Also very much. Yes. That's very much a you and me thing. I don't think it would necessarily work for everybody. Okay. Number three, Royal Visit. Yes. Number four, Lani Akea. Yeah, probably. Number five, Splendor Duel. Maybe. So that, that's a no. Maybe she it, It's either no. yes or yeah, no. no. So that's a no for you. Okay. Number six, Tether. Ooh. Yes with a caveat. Uh, you, it's a yes or no? Yes. Caveat, I wouldn't bring it to a restaurant. It's too big. That was actually my only concern about it. What am I on? One, two, three, four, five, six. Number seven, Catch the Moon. Oh, yes. Hey. Number eight, Boop. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about games that I always beat in each app, but she still likes. Uh, number nine is Tussie Mussy. Yeah, I okay. think so, yeah. Uh, number 10 is Jiper. I, I think you're going to say no. We already right? said no. Yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't say no. I either. said no last time. Uh, number 11 is Unmatched. Yes. Number 12 is Onitama. Yes. Number 13 is Shobu. Yeah. Number 14 is The Grizzled. That wasn't on your list before, I guarantee it. The last three were not. I you, okay. I went through this okay. list and I added them. I just said that. Okay. So yes ish okay. for the grizzled. Okay. I'm gonna tell you the one other thing that was on my list of four. Okay. Which was I really enjoyed playing co ops with you as a date game and we have not mentioned a lot of those. So I would say Sherlock Solitaire was a really fun co op, at least for me. Um okay. I don't have a big opinion about okay, it. I, I feel like I would want a co-op to be a little bit meatier. Yeah, I was trying to think of something that was not a lot of setup, but felt a little meatier, and I yeah. just I wasn't getting there quickly. Yeah, so, so I put I put a co-op like Sherlock Solitaire or like Wild Tales. Okay, but yeah, I don't I don't know what that thing is yeah. that is quick enough to be able to play in that kind of an environment. Yeah. So do you want me to put Sherlock Solitaire on the list as a representative light co-op? As a representative light co-op. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right, Anisha, we have 13 games on the list. <laughs> of course we do. So That's about how long the last list was. How excruciating do you want this to be? Do you want to get to five or do you want to get to 10 or somewhere in between? And we got to get to 10 at a minimum. Yeah, we got to we gotta get this down to at least 10. I'd, less than 10 would probably be better. Okay, so we're going to shoot for six. We're going to shoot for half a dozen games. That sounds good. Okay, so I'm going to go through this again. Okay. And do you want to... Do the pros and cons now, or do you want, now that I've narrowed three games off the list, to just look at the list again? Let me just read them off. Okay, we got Jekyll versus Hyde, Compile, Royal Visit, Lani Ikea, Tether, Catch the Moon, Boop, Tussie Mussy, Unmatched, Onitama, Shobu, Grizzled, and Sherlock Solitaire. Okay, so here's the thing. This list can go one of two ways from where we are now. This list can go to... I think this is a good representative of games that make good date games. Or I can go with, these are games I would play with you on a date breakfast anytime. Well, I think I think we're doing this for the listeners. Yeah. And, I, you know, we're going to talk about our contact information later. So if they want, you know, <laughs> our people are smart. Yeah. If we take things off this list, they're going to be able to figure out, <laughs> based on which way we say we're going with this, where they fall on this list. Fair enough. Our people are smart. I trust you people. You're you're good. Fair enough. I think we go with what we recommend. Okay. Not necessarily what works for us. Okay. I think because they work for us so well, I think we still keep Jekyll versus Hyde and Compile. And probably Boop. I think Boop is a better choice than something like Shobu or Onitama. Okay. Are we taking Shobu and Onitama off the list? I think we're taking those off the <gasps> list. We're at the point, by the way, where like this is already the cream of the crop. Yes. And and we just have to eliminate. This is me trying to look at the list we already have and say, you know what? We've already got a two player abstract moving across the board game. Of those, which one do I think is best for the most people? And the answer is boop. Okay. Uh what about Lani Ikea then? I think we take Lani Ikea off as well. I okay. think the cute cats in Boop, even though it's kind of a mean game. It takes the edge off the meanness and it makes it the best for okay. a date so, game. So I'm just going to throw this out there to you. I think that Boop has better table presence, possibly, than that Lani too. Ikea yeah. does. I like Lani Ikea as a just a beautiful, clean, abstract yeah. game. And I feel like some of the other games on this list, like Compile, like Catch the Moon, have great table presence. 
and fill a lot of that part of okay the need for me. So I kind of lean in the other direction on that one. That's just kind of my thoughts. Like I said, even Onitama has great table presence. I think the cuteness of Boop, really, it takes the edge off of losing, okay. which is what I, what usually happens when sure. you and I play Boop. I usually lose. It takes the edge off of losing, and it also lets you kind of personify a little bit of being mean in a way that Linnea Kea and Shobu and Onitama and games like that don't. Okay. All right. Like, Lani Ake is coming off the list. So in that kind of same sense, I'm going to take Tether off the list just because of the, yeah. like, the I love the issue. game, the space issue. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to take Tether off of the list. It's a cool game. And it's, it's a fantastic game. It's really neat to play, but you really need a lot of space to set it up. Yeah. And it can be hard to wrap your head around how that works. Yeah. I think I'm going to lean in the same direction I was before, and I'm going to advocate for taking the Grizzles off of the list. Yeah, that's that's I fine. Just, it's that's just fine. sad. <laughs> Even with the expansion, which actually makes the game better, I highly yes. recommend you use the yes. expansion. Play well, and that was and and that would have been probably the only co-op on the old list was the Grizzled. We're at eight. Can okay. we get two more off? I'm going to read what we, we have left. Okay, yeah. here we go: Jekyll versus Hyde, Compile, Royal Visit, Catch the Moon, Boop, Tussie Mussy, Unmatched. Sherlock Solitaire. Okay. So this is where we come down to the different styles of game involved. Royal Visit hits somewhere in between Compile and Jekyll versus Hyde. All three of them have a little bit of a similar feel in my brain. So I think that Compile captures the back and forth in a way that moves faster than it does in Royal Visit. Yeah. I think Jekyll versus Hyde is always moving forward. Yes. Right. There's no back and forth in Jekyll versus Hyde. It's the pressure to move forward and the resistance against that pressure. Yeah. That's yeah. all it is. So yeah. for me, I think that I lean in the direction of keeping Jekyll versus Hyde and Compile on and taking and, and Royal taking Visit Royal off, visit even off. though I love Royal Visit as a game. Yes. And I do too. But Royal Visit has that tug of war that we're not really talking right. about. Right. Which, which games. you know, again, I mean, we're talking about like, this is the 1% thing, right? <laughs> That tug of war is a great feeling. It can sometimes get frustrating. Yeah. A little bit. Whereas in Jekyll versus Hyde, it's not frustrating. It's just like an oh man kind of thing, which is different. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to take Royal Visit we'll off take the list. Royal this Visit is a, off these are hard decisions. Yeah. Okay. And so. then I think as much as I want there to be a co-op on the list, I think we take Sherlock Solitaire off. So I was actually going to say, I think we take Unmatched off. I know there's a lot of options. I know there's there's a lot there. I look at this list, and Unmatched is unquestionably the heaviest game on this list. And the largest. And the largest. And, yeah. I mean, it, it certainly the has a lot involved. of options, right? I mean, there's a flavor for everybody yeah. in this. Oh, man, this is so hard. Oh, this is so hard. Jekyll vs. Hyde, Compile, Boop. And then the last four are Catch the Moon, Tussie Mussy, Unmatched, and Sherlock Solitaire. Yeah. I think Unmatched has the polish. Uh, I think Catch the Moon has just really great table presence. Yeah, I'm honestly going to say after we play it some more, I might replace Catch the Moon with Nekojima because it can be played either cooperative or competitive. Mm, so it okay. can it can go with however you're feeling on a particular day. Catch, yeah, but that's not today. We're not right, doing that right but now. But we're not there right okay. now. Catch the Moon is always competitive and it, you can just make it as competitive or kind <laughs> as you want it to be. Sure, 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 sure. I really think they were brilliant with the wooden ladders. Like, it just really adds something to it, the way those, yeah. those ladders are wooden. All right, we got to get one more game off this list. I mean, I think we're looking at either taking Sherlock Solitaire off or we're taking Unmatched off. I think we should take Sherlock Solitaire off, although I wouldn't complain if we also took Unmatched off. I really want to keep Sherlock on here for the co-op part of it, but I just think Unmatched is too flexible. Yeah. And there's just you can find an Unmatched set that appeals to everybody. Yeah. I think I got to lean in that direction. Okay. I'm it's I'm hard. okay with that. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Okay. I do recommend like co-op games are great as date night games, but I don't think we have found a co-op game that we like as much, like a minimal setup co-op game that we like as much as any of the rest of these. We've already taken Sherlock Solitaire off this list. Yes. I propose Ultimatch. Ultimatch is fantastic. But seeing as we didn't even think about it until this point, I am going to leave it off the list. You're not I wrong. mean, we have hundreds of games. <laughs> like, the fact that I forgot it until now is not, it's not an indictment against Ultimatch. <laughs> it's not fair to do that. 
That's really hard because like that's a very light, super easy it is. It co-op. Is. It hits all those things. I actually would prefer it over Sherlock Solitaire, I think, as a light cooperative game. Mm-hmm. But you wouldn't put it on this list ahead of Unmatched. I would not. Okay. No. All right. Okay. Well, then I guess, ladies and gentlemen, we have our list. I'm going to hand it to Anitra. She's going to read it. All right. So here's the list. Our 2024 top six date games. Jekyll versus Hyde. Still mm-hmm. our number one. Yep. Which is trick taking. You got a back and forth. One person is trying to keep things balanced. One person is trying to, to either lose a lot or win a lot. Mm-hmm. Number two is Compile, which is card dueling. Mm-hmm. We've talked about that plenty recently. Just yeah. go back and look at the last couple of episodes. Yeah. The only thing I have to say about Compile is I really need to go to the Mayday website and buy the sleeves for it. <laughs> so we don't wreck the cards. Mm-hmm. Number three, Boop. 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 Mm-hmm. Where you can be mean cats and boop each other off the bed. Yep. And that applies for any of the variations of Boop. If yes. You have the, the opportunity boop, to pick up the new one. Boop the halls. All of them. All good. Pick whatever holiday theme you like or go with classic yeah, boop. Beep boop hasn't come out yet, right? No. Right. That one's going to be a little bit harder and it's robots, not cats. So it just, it can't be quite as cute. It can try. We shall see. They might be cat robots. Maybe. Number four is going to be Catch the Moon. There are other dexterity games that are also great, but this one takes up a relatively small amount of space and... You can play it as mean or as kind as you want to, really. I mentioned the wooden ladders before. This game always makes me think of The Little Prince, like every time. Yeah. I don't know why. It's the colors, whatever the vibe is. Like the, that that vibe, when you yeah. said like Mikojima might replace it, like mm, there's something about that vibe. Catch the Moon looks like a very calming game. It's really not, yeah. <laughs> um, but the look of it helps keep it from feeling too mean. I mean, it looks like it's like just right out of a French cartoon, Yeah. no matter what stage the game is in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Number five, Tussie Mussie. Great game. It's the only I Split You Choose game that works really well with two players, and the theme is great for a date because it's all about the secret language of flowers and the messages that you're sending back and forth. Mm-hmm. And number six, after much debate, <laughs> is Unmatched. This is certainly the heaviest game of the six. It's the most involved. It's got the most rules overhead. But once you have learned to play it, you can find whatever kind of set or character or whatever that you're interested in. You can even have somebody be the T-Rex or your favorite Marvel superhero. The sky is the limit. Our personal favorites are the characters that are actually in the public domain, but they're all great. And it's a game where you're totally you know, skirmishing, you're going around a board beating up each other, but it feels so thematic to the characters that it always just, it feels really good. Yep. So, there you yeah. go. That's it. We did it. We finally figured it out, Anitra. Good job. We made a list of six. We made a list of six that is probably better considered than the <laughs> much larger list we made in 2020. That's when we were young and careless. Sure, you can call it that. I wasn't even 40 yet. We had a child in kindergarten. Craziness. Anyway, (laughs) all right. Let's move on to our new backtalk question. Again, thematically appropriate, I think. What is your favorite game to play with your partner? Or, you know, just a friend or whatever. Do you ever bring games on a date? Do you have any great stories about playing a game on a date? Like somebody sees it and they're like, oh, what is this? You know, that happens to us all the time. <laughs> it's like, what, what is this game you were playing? And we get to talk about it. And they're like, that is so cool. When we when we go to our regular breakfast restaurant now, they're like, so what game did you guys bring this week? Yep, 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 yep. It's pretty great. I love it. All right. So take a look on the Discord or on Facebook in the Family Gamers community and answer our backtalk question. We would love to hear from you. You know, Anitra, we, uh, we haven't done a for science in a while. Yeah, people should send us some more weird food so we can eat it (laughs) on air or maybe take videos because now we can do that. We put them in the Family Gamers Facebook chat or on the Discord when we take videos of us eating weird food. Yeah, why not? (laughs) Anyway, if you would like to do that, if you'd like to send us weird food, you can send it to the Family Gamers, 60 Auburn Street, A-U-B-U-R-N, number 528, Auburn, Massachusetts. 01501. Of course, all of this information, including what the actual top six games were, the address, all of these things 
are in the show notes on our site, thefamilygamers.com. Mm-hmm. And if you have questions about any of these things, say you can't be bothered to go to the website, you want to just poke us on social media and get answers there, you can obviously do that. You can find us on Facebook, X, Threads, Instagram, or TikTok, or YouTube, at Family Gamers AA. You already heard us welcome the Facebook community members. You, too, can be a part of that group. Go to thefamilygamers.com slash community. It'll drop you right in there. You can join the group, and we will welcome you on the next podcast episode. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if you would like to reach out to us privately, you can do so over email, andrew at thefamilygamers.com. Anitra at thefamilygamers.com. I have to mention the Discord. I really like the community that we've been building there. It's really nice. Everybody is really nice to each other. Uh, and we're all trying to support each other as we play games with the kids in our lives. Mm-hmm. You it's can... not just us, by the way. Yeah, not just us. Also, little big thumbs, brains on games, a few others, and you know maybe a few other family gamer content creators will poke their heads in there every once in a while and answer some questions as well. Uh, we think that the easiest way to get there is go to thefamilygamers.com slash discord and it'll drop you right in with an invite to the overall community. All right. Anitra, one of my favorite things about this past week was the fact that it actually got kind of cold outside. I put on pants instead of shorts for the first time in a while and I put on a hoodie. Did you wear your Family Gamers hoodie? I did not wear my Family Gamers hoodie, but I did wear a hoodie. Okay. If it's hoodie weather where you are, you can get yourself a Family Gamers hoodie that says play games with your kids on the back. It's a pretty awesome hoodie. Mm-hmm. At our merch store, thefamilygamers.com slash merch. Mm-hmm. We're not taking the t-shirts down, though, just because it's getting cold outside, so you can still get t-shirts. But if you like some tea, you could get a Family Gamers mug that you could have your tea mm-hmm. in. So that'd mm-hmm. be pretty sweet as well. Please don't forget to subscribe to the show, tell your friends about the show, and tell everybody else about the show by leaving us a review at Apple Podcast or whatever your podcast subscription source is. If you would like to help us grow the podcast, please, please leave us a review on whatever your your situation is. Yeah. Uh, those actually mean a lot. Not just a rating, but an actual written review. You can also find us on Amazon Music, TuneIn, Spotify, basically anywhere fine podcasts are sold. Are sold for free. Are sold. Yes. The Family Gamers is sponsored as well by First Move Financial, and we really appreciate it. You should go to firstmovefinancial.com slash family gamers and learn how the team at First Move Financial can help you pile up the victory points. So you can figure out how to beat Anitra at games. Or Ander. Or Anitra. (laughs) Anyway. All right. So, uh, Anitra, in uh, just one short week, our kids will be back in school. I mean, it starts slow here. We got like two days and then four days off. And I don't care. It doesn't matter to on, me. Whatever. But school will start. We will have something resembling a normal schedule again. I will actually be able to work on Snap Review videos during the day. I'm excited Maybe. for all of those things. I'm mostly excited that hopefully we can get back to a regular game playing schedule, especially on Thursday mornings. Deep breakfast. And we'll tell you all about those in a couple of weeks. So until then, everybody, play Play games games with your kids. kids.